This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. This is the Planet X Network. And stay tuned for the Ben Emlyn Jones Show. It's coming up next. And welcome, welcome to the Ben Emlyn Jones Show on Planet X Radio. Tune in for all the latest news, views and reviews from the world of government cover-ups, ghosts, UFOs, paranormal investigation, hidden knowledge, forbidden history and archaeology, chemtrails and hospital porters. Ah, the date is Wednesday, it is the 21st of August 2013, it's 8pm and I do hope you're all sitting comfortably and awaiting this show which is coming and I've got a awful lot to talk about this evening but um, first of all thanks to everybody who uh, wrote to me after um, last week's show which of course was the first Ben Emlyn Jones show on Planet X Radio people were saying congratulations on a new program saying how much they liked it saying you know they really really thanking me for what I did and I want to say to those people I really appreciate your support and thank you very much it's really really good that you like you do enjoy what I do and um, I hope you'll enjoy this program as much as you did last week's our first one um someone interestingly told me that i have the perfect voice for radio which is uh, really really great because um for many years people have told me i've got the perfect face for radio so now i have the perfect voice as well so it's a double bonus thank you very much on today's show we're going to discuss um well i'll tell you what i've been up to since the last program i've been to see santos bonacci live at Truth Juice Leicester. Now that was quite something, I'll tell you. I've got a lot to say about that. We're also going to be discussing um, cyberbullying, a a very important subject I think is relevant. And um, once more, we're going to be talking about Area 51 being revealed, or not. We shall see. Anyway, stay tuned for that, because also, later on, we're going to be talking about space weather, and I'll be doing my routine space weather report, like I always do, and that's very important, because things out there do affect what goes on down here. So, stay where you're sitting and do not touch your dials. All that is coming up. Get in touch with Planet X. Call, text, email, find us on Facebook. Now, Santos Bonacci is a man who most people in the alternative community have now heard of, although a couple of years ago he was virtually unknown. Um, now he's, uh, he's a very, very interesting man, and I do recommend you do go and see him live if you get the chance, because... Uh, he's actually on a tour of the United Kingdom at the moment, and um, it's this very well. It's called Syncretism and Light. Yes, uh, synchron- Synchronism and the Science of Light. That's what it's called. And um, he's basically he arrived on the beginning of the month, and he's basically going all over the country, speaking at very different, various different places. He's speaking in Ireland as well, and I think he's going over to the Netherlands to speak there. Now. If you want to, you know, he actually, as this show goes to air, he's going to be speaking at Glastonbury. But um, t- tomorrow, he's actually going to be at the Truth Juice Gathering, which is at the Stonehenge campsite. And uh, then next Wednesday, he's going to be at Zoo Studios, ZU, that is, which is in Lewis, East Sussex. On Friday, the 30th of August, he's at Truth Juice Brighton. And Saturday, the 30th of August, he's at the Passing Clouds Workshop in London. And on the Sunday after, the 1st of September, He's at the Bread and Roses pub in in uh, workshop, which is in London. So do go and see him if you get the chance. Now, he's a really, really interesting guy, as I said. And I went there to see him last Saturday with Sue, my girlfriend. And she was even keener than I was because she's a really dedicated fan of his. So we went to from Nottingham to Leicester to the Music Cafe, which is a very charming kind of pub, nightclub, theatre, 
with a bohemian atmosphere, so it's absolutely ideal. And Santos was there, and he spoke from midday till six in the evening, all all afternoon, with breaks, of course. And he was packed with information. I, I mean, I, I can't begin to relate the actual information in detail. I didn't pick up all the details, even though I was making notes as furiously as I could. But um, what he's basically discovered is that um, a lot of the ancient texts in the world, especially those the, the most familiar religious texts, um, like the Old Testament, like the Gospels, the Holy Quran, the Torah, are in fact full of symbolism and allegories of the stars and planets. And the same goes for much more recent artwork like Leonardo da Vinci. And um, the, some architecture as well, like you get in churches and cathedrals and in the Vatican. Now, Santos calls this field of study astrotheology. And it's really, really interesting because there's no doubt that in his mind, and I think in mine too, that whoever created these works knew an awful lot about the sky above us. And they wanted to encode that information cryptically into these texts. And, in fact, Santos says that there are seven levels of metaphor, which is rather like the Masonic law, because, of course, Masonic rites are supposedly to be interpreted differently depending on your degree within the Masonic hierarchy. Now, I should say now, it's not my intention to offend anyone, and I know that you know some of you listening will believe in some of the great religions in the world. You may well be Muslims, Jews, Christians, whatever, and it's not my intention to offend you at all. And I know you interpret these things literally. Um, but the thing about it is, I mean... I think Santos here has a point, and I think I don't want to un- downplay the wisdom that you can find in many of these ancient religious texts. But at a high level, they tell a different story. Now, who wrote them, and for what purpose, I don't know. You know, I know people would say, for instance, um, Jesus Jesus died on the cross, and he came back to life three three days later. All right. Now, Santos says that that is an allegory of the sun, and the passage of the sun through the zodiac, through the course of the year, on the ecliptic, as the Earth goes around the Sun in in the space of a year. And there are very, very, very large numbers of figures in mythology who um, were born on the 25th of December to a virgin mother. They uh, died, and then they were buried, and they came back to life three days later. That's a recurring theme. It's a meme that exists within um, all kinds of ancient texts, from ancient Egypt... Um, to indigenous cultures, to um, ancient Babylon, Sumer. It's just it's just the way these stories happen to be, and it, um, it's not to to. I'm not downplaying the wisdom you can find in the Gospels, the the sto- the message of Jesus. The same goes for the for the Quran and for the, te- the you know the, the Kabbalah or Jewish texts like the Torah. Okay, there is wisdom, there's goodness in those texts. Um, now. Santos Bonacci, I mean, no one had heard of him until about three years ago. Um, see, he's um, he's taken, the, like I said, he's become very well known re- since then. And I was quite, it was quite amazing to meet him because he's a lot smaller than I expected, I must say. He's only five foot something and he's really slim. He's very slender indeed. And so he's a tiny little bloke, <clears throat> but he's got this broad smile and he's twinkling bright dark eyes and... Amazing energy, you know, amazing spirit he's, he has. And he's very warm and down to earth because when we got there, the doors were shut and he arrived at the same time. So he queued with the rest of us and he was talking to us in the queue. And there must have been about, there must have been about 50 people there. Um, and he was just sitting there chatting with us. And he's very, very easy going too when there's a crisis because um, his PowerPoint failed at a crucial, at a crucial moment during his speech, which um, anyone who uses PowerPoint will know that that does happen very often. Um, and he just chuckled and he carried on with his speech while the technical support crew fiddled around desperately with it. Um, <clears throat> it's, it was really, really good to see. And um, I mean, he used a whiteboard and pen for most of his visuals anyway, so it wasn't really a problem. But he did strike me as someone who just picks himself up and keeps going in, in spirit, in, in, in a healthy spirit of optimism. Now, um, he speaks with this very lively, intelligent tone as well. He's got this strong Australian accent. But he can really, really speak well indeed, and um, very, very eloquent and articulate. And he is an expert linguist. He doesn't only speak English, he does. He speaks Spanish, and he does interviews in Spanish. And he is of Italian extraction, and he speaks Italian fluently. Also Japanese, because apparently he's married to a Japanese woman. But also I hear he speaks French and Portuguese. Um, he's been interested in this subject, which he, 
he calls astrotheology, as I said. Um, he's been studying it for over 30 years. But, um, you know, this is almost like the culmination of what he's learned in all that time. And I think his work fills this major gap in our attempts to uncover this esoteric world that you might have heard about, um, which is hidden from us by the powers that be. And um, people like um, Lincoln, Bajant and Lee with the Holy Blood, Holy Grail have written about this. Lynn Picknett and Lawrence Gardner, people like that, um, they've been trying to uncover this too. And Santos Bonacci, I think, deserves to be included among those for sure. Um, he's, he likes Dr. Louis Turi. I, I asked him about Dr. L Dr. Turi because um, Dr. Turi, of course, was on the last um, Planet X radio show and um, Santos knows him and um, he's, he likes him. And um, I met up with some other, lots of friends there and there was lots of people there. Some of them I already knew, some of them I hadn't met yet, but um, it's always good to uh, meet up with uh, all kinds of people. New friends, familiar faces, um, you know, and those who are in between. So, do go and see Santos Bonacci live if you get the chance. I do recommend it heartily. Planet X, online, on your mobile. Right, um, and now we're going to discuss a, a rather distressing subject, but I think it does need to be discussed, and that is the problem of trolls, or cyberbullying, whichever term you choose. I know the correct term for a troll is something slightly different, but I call them trolls. Um, I'm basically referring to people who decide that this great medium we have, the internet, this great outlet for free expression and um, the publication of the thoughts of ordinary people, the greatest invention, I think, in those terms since the printing press, some people um, decide, instead of doing the great good with the internet, which it could be, could be done with it, which Planet X does with it, all the good we can do, these people decide to do a lot of bad with it. They take advantage of the anonymity and freedom that the internet gives to go around the internet antagonizing other people. Um, this is the worst kind of bullying, I think, the, the most sadistic and cowardly type. Um, and anyone who goes online and uses the internet for any period of time, it'll sooner or later come across one of these individuals. Now, um, I'm very, very well aware that I mean, I've spoken about this myself before, I've talked about it a lot, and the, the, medium is, the media is covering, with, is covering it now, and my first instinct is to be pleased, because um, I'm, I'm acutely aware that there are some people targeted by cyber bullies who are, are far more vulnerable than a certain tough, ugly ex-hospital porter you might be familiar with. I know of cases in which... You know, which cyber bullies have driven people to depression and even suicide and in such cases I think there's blood on the hands of the trolls they're no better than murderers and so like I said my first instinct is to rejoice when the mainstream media covered not one but three such cases in the space of the week the first case they covered was of a lady called Caroline Criado Perez who um she was uh, she's a feminist campaigner and she was campaigning for um a woman's face that of Jane Austen to be placed on a banknote in this case the 10 pound note um now I'm not a supporter of feminism but um I think good good idea why not have Jane Austen's face on a 10 pound note I think that's Jane Austen contributed enormously to literature so yeah good for her um of course not everyone agreed and in in one case a 21-year-old man who has now been arrested decided to deluge Twitter with abuse against her, including death threats, threats of rape, threats of mutilation, and threats to bomb her house. Now, um, there was a huge scandal over this, quite rightly, and Twitter were, were accused of not doing enough about it, which indeed they were not. Uh, this carried on later on. I mean, there was... Um, there was a campaign to boycott Twitter for a while, including, and many, many people were supporting that, including actors and actresses, and um, various um, um, sports, you know, um, sports stars and people like that who were taking part in this boycott of Twitter to try and to prevent this from happening again. Now, um, the news did cover it, which is great. I'm glad they covered it, but. Um, it carried on, you see, but it carried on later on. What happened was, 
a young girl called Hannah Smith. This was the next part of this um, this series of this series of tragedies. A 14-year-old girl from Leicestershire called Hannah, Hannah Smith committed suicide, and she committed suicide because she was bullied on a social networking site, something called Ask F Ask .fm. Now, um, the, obviously, the family are, are devastated, and they've been and there's a big inquest going on about it. And unfortunately, I, mean, I can well believe this could happen because I, I know how evil these people can be. I really do. And then later on, there was um, a few days later, there was yet another um, case. I think this was just a few days after that case. And that was the case of Daniel Perry. Now, he is a young man from Dunfermline in Fife, in Scotland, who um, killed himself over an internet scam. What happened was... He was lured into getting involved in some kind of sexual activity on the internet, which involved him taking photos of himself in a compromising position. Now, he's perfectly entitled to do that. He's 17 years old. He's over the age of consent. There's nothing legally wrong with what he was doing at all. Unfortunately, um, he, was, he was a trap. What happened was the people involved on the other end were actually blackmailers. They, they, they saved these photographs... And then they wrote to him, threatening to send them to his parents, to his school teachers, to his employers, to everybody, unless he coughed up with some money. And um, his, unfortunately, what he did was he jumped off a bridge and um, it, and died, which is an absolutely devastating thing to happen. Now, um, as I said, you know, I'm no one sympathises with these people more than me. I mean, I've had trolls. I mean, I'm not as... I'm, I think I'm more resilient than these young people who've been, who were driven to these desperate ends. And I, I think... Um, I know, But I know... I can imagine myself in their position. I can put myself in their position. I was a kid once. I mean, I w was vulnerable. I can well imagine, when you consider the severity of the kind of abuse that goes on on the internet, that um, someone might end up taking their own life as a result so as I said I, I was about to rejoice that the mainstream media was covering these subjects this subject this um this the plight of these people but then I remembered something just a week before that David Cameron had come on stage and announced that the UK government was going to try and pressure the law into bringing in internet censorship now, is it a coincidence that David Cameron says this and then these cases of internet abuse are suddenly highlighted in the media? Because cases like this go on all the time. Trolls have been around since the, since the internet began. So suddenly it's in the media. And I think, unfortunately, we're looking at a case of what David Icke calls problem, reaction, solution. That um, the ordeal of these women, this woman on Twitter and the memory of the two young people who killed themselves is going to be exploited for this agenda. What's, what Cameron is hoping for, using his, own, his, his, his colleagues, his lapdogs, his, his agents in the media, is to try and persuade the public that anyone who doesn't agree with internet censorship is going to be branded heartless, uncaring about the victims of cyberbullying. But as I've said, I'm far from heartless and uncaring. And I, but I feel we must be on our guard against this kind of thing. We must be on our guard against the government harnessing the plight of these poor people into a scheme to shut down people's access to free information. Because I think the ultimate goal, what the government want to do, is have the ability to block any website they want. And they want to, they want to use cyberbullying simply as an excuse. They don't give a damn about cyberbullying. They don't give a damn in hell if every single person under 18 who goes on the website is trolled and abused and ends up killing themselves. They don't care one little jot. All they want to do is they want to be able to control the internet. They want to be able to suppress and block any website that promotes subversive thinking and publishes suppressed information. Like, for example, Planet X Radio. So, that's something to think about, I reckon. Right, well, if you've been reading the news lately, you'll know that Area 51 has been revealed. That's right, um, all the secrets that um, 
were at this secret base have now been declassified and we know everything there is to know about it. Yes, the government have come clean and said, all right, guys, this is what Area 51 is. We're holding the, we're holding the doors wide open. Right. Indeed. Yes. Well, there has been some news reports recently re re um, released, which, um, well, I suppose they're interesting in their own way. <laughs> but um, I think there's a slightly more to the subject than meets the eye, slightly more than what we've been told. Now, uh, this media release about Area 51 has been kind of trumpeted everywhere, all over the place. Um, BBC have covered it, and... Um, they, I remember on the they even interviewed on television um, Darren Perks of the Darren Perks show right here on Planet X, one of our very own Planet X family. And um, you can listen to his show tomorrow evening. I'm sure we'll tell you all about it. <coughs> um, basically, what's happened is um, there's been a, a Freedom of Information Act request uh, by, by a man called um, Jeff Richelson who is a senior fellow at the National Security Archive um, at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And um, the CIA sent him a document all about their secret spy plane program from the Cold War. That's what it, that's what it is, basically. What happened was, okay, well, Area 51, I'm sure most of you well already know this, but for those of you who don't, Area 51 is a highly secure military compound in Nevada, USA. It's absolutely huge. In fact, it covers um, several hundred square miles, I think, and um, it's basically completely sealed off. Um, you can't get within a few miles of it because there's this um, border, which there's no fence there, but it's there's warning notices on the roadside and it's patrolled regularly by security guards. Now, what happened was it was um, it was established to by the government as part of a secret aviation program. What happened was um, they had a spy plane program called U-2, or Dragon Lady, which began in the 1950s and um, flew right through to the 1960s. And um, it was kept secret. It was highly secretive, top secret. And its declassification has now supposedly led to the government revealing all the secrets of Area 51. Well, in tr the truth of the matter is, although the, the U-2 spy plane project was developed and operated in the strictest of secrecy, okay, it involved the construction of the most advanced aeroplanes and cameras ever built. But almost science fiction, almost science fictional in their advancement compared to the conventional technology of the time. It also involved the recruitment of America's best combat pilots to the CIA. And it operated for a number of years, but its cover was eventually blown in May 1960 um, in a very spectacular fashion, actually, because one of the aircraft was shot down while spying on the Soviet Union in May of 1960. Now, the planning and preparation for the program had to be carried out in secrecy. And um, so this involved the testing of the aircraft. So in 1955, the CIA actually acquired an old World War II airfield. And this airfield was sited on the land which was purchased by the Atomic en Energy Commission's territory, which was used during the Manhattan Project to develop the first atomic bomb in the world. Um, now, um, this territory was marked out in various areas, areas and the place where this, this auxiliary airfield was was area number 51. <coughs> and so area number 51 became the site of where they were developing the test the test airfield for these super secret aircraft that were going to fly in this U-2 spy plane program. So they sealed it off from the public and it's been sealed off ever since. Um, it's now officially known as the Groom Lake Test Facility and um, it would continue to be used as a secret test site for these successors to the U-2 program like the Lockheed A-12 and the SR-71 Blackbird aircraft. And the latest stealth fighters and stealth bombers, they were all developed there and they were trialled at Groom Lake facility, which is conveniently close to the Lockheed Skunk Works. So um, it's quite easy to get you know, the prototype aircraft from the factory to the test site. And it's probably still being used for that purpose today and speculation is rife about what new kind of spy plane and other kinds of hardware might be there. There's this rumour of an aircraft called Aurora which is supposedly the next generation of spy aircraft after um, after the Blackbird. 
and the base also housed enemy aircraft which were captured during the Cold War the Soviet MiG fighters for instance and they, the Americans were analysing and enge the engineering of these machines so they could find ways of designing new weapons and new tactics that could deal with them uh, the location has many nicknames Dreamland, Paradise Ranch now um, and various other, it's known by various other names. It was had no official name until but it, recently, but it's now called the Groom Lake Test Facility. Anyway, in 1977, Stanton Friedman um, investigated the Roswell incident for the first time, and then the gravity of UFO research shifted from, quote, lights in the sky to lies on the ground, unquote. And then in 1989, Bob Lazar came forward, and he nominated Area 51 as a location for extraterrestrial research from craft captured during the Roswell incident and other areas. Um, he claimed to be someone who actually worked on this program. He said he was a scientist who was recruited to analyse the, the wreckage of these, of these that came from these various salvage operations at Roswell and other places. And of course there's a lot of talk about aliens, the bodies of aliens being captured as well and even living aliens. There's rumours that living aliens exist there too. Anyway, the highly secure perimeter of the base is now a very popular location for tourists, especially those with an interest in the UFO phenomenon, and these um, civilian security contractors called camo dudes are constantly on patrol keeping these people away from crossing over the boundary line into the compound. Now, I know a lot of people who've actually gone to Groom Lake Road and they've seen Area 51 it's always tempting to maybe take, you know, run inside, but I do recommend you don't because what happens is the camo dudes will come down and they will capture you and they'll hand you over to the local sheriff and you'll get a $600 fine. If you do it again, you get a $6,000 fine. But legally, once you step inside the base, they can shoot you. And the, the company that, that runs these camo dudes is actually... It has a bad reputation for trigger-happy behaviour in when it's been in Iraq and Bosnia and places like that. So, I do recommend you don't mess with these camo dudes. You know, you might you might not live to regret it. Now, um, Nick Pope has stated that he believes because Area 51 has all this attention on it, that if there were sort of like alien bodies and wreckage and things like that. The government would have moved them away somewhere else long ago, you know, unless... Unless this is a double bluff, eh, Nick? Do let me know if it is. Anyway, um, this announcement came out in the media. The United States authorities are finally coming clean about Area 51. That's right, there's going to be no secrets anymore. It was all over the news. Yes, indeed. <laughs> For instance, um, the BBC was saying, The CIA has officially acknowledged the secret US test site, known as Area 51, in a new unclassified internal history of the U-2 spy plane program. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it sounds good on the, on the surface, all right? It's, for someone who may not know any better, it may seem, you know, it, it, may, it may seem like, oh, this is, oh, that's okay then, you know. It includes an unredacted map of the site, and, you know, never identified before, things like that. And um, Jeffrey, I think Jeffrey Richardson understands the limitations of this, and I hope other people do as well. The truth of the matter is, um, you have to ask yourself, just how explosive is this divulgement? Um, well, firstly, the CIA documents that were released to Mr. Richardson don't actually divulge any significant information that hasn't already seeped out over the years anyway. You've got to understand there's a great deal of difference between something genuinely unknown and something that is merely unacknowledged by officialdom. Now it's never been formally acknowledged that the Groom Lake base exists, that's true, but then did you know it's never been formally acknowledged that Trident submarines are armed with nuclear weapons? It's true. If you ask someone in government, you go up to Nick Pope or whoever, his equivalent who deals with the Trident submarine program, you say, have you got nuclear weapons on those submarines? They'll say, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Although surely there's no doubt that the Trident submarines do have nuclear weapons. And besides all this, there has been a formal announcement of the base existence before. It actually happened in 1994. What happened was, the widow of a man called Robert Frost sued the US government for damages after he died of an illness which she believed was caused by his exposure to unknown toxic material while he was serving at the base. 
Now, the government's defence was that um, they couldn't, you know, all, all everything was legal, everything was buffed board because of the reasons of national security, and they couldn't reveal, you know, what these toxic materials was for that reason. Uh, and Mr. Frost was, you know, was was not. No one was liable for compensation over Mr. Frost's um, injuries because of the interests of national security. But to do that, the government had to admit that Mr. Frost's place of employment was real. So they did formally announce that there was a facility at the Groom Lake location. And there's been other similar scoops in the past. You know, it's 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 actually there's been several instances where the government have actually revealed the, the, formally the existence of Area 51. Um, they haven't said anything more about it. They've just said, oh yeah, we've got a facility out there at Groom Lake, and um, it's involving classified operations. That's it. That's the end of story. Now. Um, there's a, there was a news, there was a TV news report about the Frost lawsuit, which I saw a couple of years ago, and I can't find it now. I'm sorry about this, but the plaintiff's lawyer was asked if there were aliens at Area 51, and he said, "I don't know. My client never saw any, but it wouldn't surprise me. You must realise that that place is a legal black hole. It operates above congressional oversight, above executive oversight. Hell, even the U.S. president himself cannot enter it without permission." And one is forced to consider whether it is even part of the United States at all, and might instead be an enclave of some kind of super government. Unquote. Now these are astounding words, but they are potentially accurate. If you remember that um, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, in his farewell president presidential address in January of 1961, warned the American people about the dangers of the military industrial complex. The military industrial complex has become a, a buzzword since then. It was first mentioned on that day. And a few people of course did heed his warning, including Eisenhower's successor John F. Kennedy, until his very untimely and suspicious death in November of 1963. Now, um, did any of you watch the recently concluded citizens' hearings on disclosure? I was absolutely glued to them. Um, now, what happened was they, during those hearings, they they interviewed, they they broadcast an interview with a terminally ill man, an, an elderly man, who was in a chronic palliative care home, who claimed to be a former U.S. intelligence agent. Now, this interview took place in March of this year. The current status of the wit the current status of the witness is not known to me at this time. But according to this man, um, operations related to extraterrestrials were already underway by the late 1950s, and that the public investigation, Project Blue Book, which was basically the U.S. Air Force's public open investigation into UFOs, was a, just a deliberate distraction. I can well believe that actually. Now, President Eisenhower was apparently not initiated into this operation. He wasn't cleared for it, and he wasn't involved, which annoyed him because, he, of course, he was the um, President of the United States. He was the head of state. He was the commander-in-chief of the U.S. Armed Forces. And he was so deeply concerned, apparently, by these clandestine, clandestine goings-on in Area 51 that he made a resolution to actually invade the base with military force, if necessary. I mean, what are we talking about here? We're talking about civil war? The US president is invading what is supposedly an American military base with military force. Now, taking all of what I've said into account, I'm really going to have to declare that this media fanfare is, pra is, is very, very unjustified. And this whole idea, the secrets being finally exposed, is it's practically worthless. Very little has been declassified that is not already common knowledge anyway. And if there are aliens at Area 51, we are not one single inch closer to them. Planet X. The truth is on air. Now, I should, I should say a few words about ufology in general, actually, because, um, you know, it's one of the subjects I'm most interested in. I mean, I am, as I've explained before, pretty much a jack-of-all-trades and master of none in this business, which is why at the introduction to my programme I've said, you know, the Ben Emlyn Jones show is about all these things, government cover-ups, paranormal investigations, ghosts, UFOs, etc. So I cover a, a wide variety of topics and I spread myself thinly. So, you know, I'm not an expert as such on anything in particular, but um, UFOs is something that I... is among my favourite topics. Um, 
I think it's among certainly among the most important subjects in this whole plethora of alternative thought that's going on at the moment and that plethora itself is extremely important too um, now as far as ufology goes there are of course many many people who study it as a scientific discipline and they believe that some of what we see in the sky can't be explained by conventional means now um, there's a logic system involved in this as is always the case which does say things which I think is very important I think we do need to bear in mind is that when you see something in the sky you can't explain um, you can't just immediately jump to conclusion that it's an alien spacecraft and Darren made this point in his show last week it is important to bear in mind that you may see something in the sky that looks unusual and sometimes things high up in the sky do look unusual but they may just be ordinary objects you're seeing them from a certain angle in a certain way from a certain distance in relation to other objects in the sky that may make them look strange and may make you think I don't know what that is so um, in those circumstances whenever you're studying ufology it's always, impo it's always important to eliminate some very obvious non-extraterrestrial possibilities before you start saying well maybe this is something strange maybe this is something not of this world um, and I do agree with that I honestly do and I understand that if you come across a UFO report of a sighting or someone tells you a close encounter story and you're reading their report or you're talking to them and you you are you realize that what they're saying could have a very very simple mundane explanation and of course you have to act on that I do understand that and as I've explained there are a few very obvious non-ET explanations for something and if you know there are there are these explanations are there then you should always go with them or, or at least ex explore them or assume that these this is what this this sighting is most likely to be um, and as people quote all the time and it's it's um, I mean um, Nick Pope puts the figure at 98 percent Timothy Good says 95 percent um, other people say I'm talking about the proportion of UFO reports that can be explained in mundane terms I don't know what the actual proportion is but I don't know if it's as high as 90 something percent but it is the majority there's no doubt about it I mean um, a book I read when I was a kid a, ch a children's book on UFOs put the figure at 67 um, percent but whatever it is the majority can be explained in mundane terms the problem is that with this is and I've experienced this okay because I do look at both sides of the story I read the books and I listen to the lectures of people you might call UFO skeptics or UFO debunkers and um, if you go to UFO conferences actually some of them actually do actually highlight highlight these cases and they actually do these speakers they actually allow these people in as speakers and you can actually listen to them put their case across and I've been to a couple of these conferences um, the, what you'll find is a lot of people within this UFO skeptic debunking community they take what I've just said but then they they extend it to what I think is an extreme case of bad logic they extend it to a point to, really to the realms of absurdity um, and the, the, what they say is instead of saying well you should always explore some very obvious non ET mundane possibilities first they say you must eliminate every physically possible mundane non ET case before you consider that the um, UFO might actually be an alien spacecraft that to me is bad logic and I'll give you an explanation I'll give you uh, an example of what I mean yeah, I'll give you a, just a hypothetical example. This, isn't, this never really happened. This is just something I made up. Imagine that a man walking his dog on Canuck Chase one night, excuse, excuse the cliche, um, saw a UFO land beside him. His flying saucer came down beside him and some aliens got out and said hello to him. At the very same time, a police van full of very highly trained officers got out and they saw it too. And they report a UFO in cogent and co corroborating detail. But then later in the week, you meet a man in a pub who tells you that his best friend's cousin's daughter's school teacher's milkman was out walking that same night 
and he saw a man with a crazy mirror from a circus or a fairground rather who was walking through the woods at the very and then at the very same moment that he was within 10 or 15 miles of the witnesses and then he dropped the mirror and it broke and shards of glass flew everywhere and then at that exact same moment in time a lighthouse 15 miles away had a sudden surge of power and reflected its beam inland to strike the mirror shards and create a visual effect that looks nothing like what the 12 witnesses describe but it still could explain the experience the experience in mundane terms right would you think that makes more sense than what i think is a far more logical and parsimonious explanation a real flying saucer landed that night that's the question now according to the skeptic debunking mindset you would ex you would you have to ask them and i actually asked someone this i said would you accept that explanation rather than the possibility that this actually was an ET event. And you know what he said? Credit to him. I asked. I actually asked someone personally on the internet. And he said, yes. I would accept that explanation you've just given rather than say that this was an ET event. This is what I mean by bad logic. It effectively makes... <coughs> it effectively... It makes the sceptic position on UFOs unfalsifiable. If someone comes to you with a... Um, a UFO story. It's no longer a feat of. It's no longer an act of science to investigate it. It's a, it's a feat of the imagination. All you have to do is imagine a physically possible non-ET explanation, and you've won the debate by default. This is the problem. I mean, a well-known member of the UFO debunking community recently wrote a book about the famous Bedouin Mountains incident, which took place in North Wales in January of 1974. Now, what happened in one of the um, Biggest, uh, one of the biggest, most um, spectacular features of that sighting was the presence of a bright light in the sky and an earthquake, which happened within within a minute of each other. The majority of witnesses actually experienced these two events. I mean, other people saw them much closer up. These these objects, and they have much more cl close encounter type in, um, evidence. But um, most of the witnesses just saw this this light in the sky and this light over the mountains, and then this, they felt this earthquake. Now. Um, According to this particular debunker in his book, um, the light in the sky was a bolide meteor, a type of a lump of rock basically that has entered the Earth's atmosphere and has burnt up, and that the earthquake was just an earthquake, which does happen. It's extremely rare in that part of the world, which is northeast Wales. In fact, I, I used to, I come from Wales, and I never remember an, entire, an earthquake the entire time I lived there. Um, and of course, a, a bolide, re bolide meteors are not that common either. I mean, um, if you regularly go out and look for them all night, you'll probably see one sooner or later, but they don't happen every day. And um, so but these two things happen so close together. In fact, they happened almost simultaneously. And, you, you, and if you read the book and the author addresses this point, and what he says is, it's just a coincidence. It's just a coincidence. And that's a get-out-of-jail-free card. For any debunker, the the problem with this 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 coincidence idea is that um, anything can be a coincidence, and this is what I mean. This is this is another form of bad logic, which a lot of debunkers, not just UFO debunkers, but a lot of other, a lot of other debunkers make. You can all any you can always say something as a coincidence, and no one can prove you wrong. It's unfalsifiable. And I read a book, actually, a brilliant book. The title was called Beyond Coincidence, and I can't remember the author's name, but it was really, really good because it ends with a fictional account of a man who wins the national lottery. So he he uh, gets very he, so he wins the national lottery. He goes out and buys a ticket, and he wins it the next week as well. He goes out and buys another ticket, and he wins it the third week in a row, and he wins it the fourth week in a row. He keeps winning. He uses chooses different numbers every time, and he keeps winning the national lottery, the jackpot. After five weeks, the police arrest him. And he's taken to court. He's charged with fraud because they, because they, they suspect him of cheating. Um, and, of course, he goes to court and um, he gets the best lawyer because, of course, he can afford one after winning the lottery five weeks in a row. <laughs> and um, the prosecution puts its case across and says, this man has won the national lottery five weeks in a row. What's going on here? And, um, the, man st and the man stands up and he, to give his defence and he says, Your Honour, I'm just a very lucky guy. And he sits down again. 
And you know what? The judge has to acquit him, and the jury, they quit him. They have to acquit him. They can't find him guilty, because what he's just said is unfalsifiable. He could, it is possible, extremely unlikely, but possible to win the National Lottery five weeks in a row. Okay. The police have investigated. They haven't found anything, any tampering with the machines. Lancelot and Guinevere haven't had their insides fiddled with. The sets of balls haven't been weighted or anything like that. Everything's been done, in, you know, there's no direct evidence that any f act of fraud has taken place. All they have is the circumstantial evidence of an extremely unlikely situation. And so, he's found not guilty. He has to be found not guilty. And this is the position that the UFO debunkers are in. Um, now, I actually addressed this. I went to the ASAP conference in Bath last year, and I actually addressed this point to one of the speakers. And I said, well, look, wouldn't you be, wouldn't, would you say that someone winning the National Lottery five weeks in a row was coincidence? And he says, no, that can't be coincidence. And I says, well, why not? And he says, well, that's so unlikely. Said, okay, you say that a bolide meteor and an earthquake is coincidence, but someone winning the National Lottery five weeks in a row is not. Is not. All right, so if you're going to decide which is coincidence and which is not... On the basis of probability, on how un, on the on the statistical and the statistical nature, that is, how unlikely it is, what are the odds against it, things like that, then you have to define where the line is drawn between one and the other. And he was absolutely stumped; he didn't know what to say. But it's true; you have to put a line down the middle and say, okay, everything on that side is is significant, everything on that side is coincidence. But the coincidence theorists, these sceptic debunkers, they never do that. The reason is because. Because this coincidence theory, their, their, their little word coincidence, it's their joker, and they know it. This is what I mean by bad logic. Now, to go back to the um, situation I was talking about before, about the man I asked online, I said, well, would you accept this ridiculous theory of a, a, a guy with a crazy mirror from a fairground walking through a woods? You know, um, and he said yes. I said, well, why? And he said, <coughs> he said, he said, it's to do with what he calls Occam's razor. Now, Occam's razor is something the sceptics love. It's a reasoning system by which, um, if you want to solve a problem, you always go for the most simple explanation first. Um, for instance, if your radio breaks down, the most unlikely, the most likely explanation for that happening is the batteries have gone flat. So you change the batteries before you, and then see if that works. And most of the times, that will fix the problem. The radio will start working before, and you always do that before you open the radio up and start fiddling with its innards. Now. The problem with Occam's razor is it's based on presumptions. It's it's based on a hierarchy of odds that is known about. So it's related to this coincidence fallacy that I've just talked about. If my radio breaks down, of course, I have to know how the radio works first. I have to know that a flat battery is more likely than something inside going wrong. We And we all have to agree on how the radio works. Occam's razor is only valid within this agreed consensus of perception. What I mean by that is, we have to know how unlikely, how, which is more likely, that a real extraterrestrial craft landed, or that some guy was walking through the woods, he'd lost his way on the way to a fairground, he dropped a crazy mirror, and light shone on it, and shone on it at the same time. And it didn't even look like what the witnesses described. What I've actually, what I've actually, this story I've come up with, this imagining story, is not that different to the Rendlesham Forest incident, actually. And you know, you, you, it's, it's unbelievable the kind of explanations that people come up with for the Rendlesham Forest incident. You know, truckloads of burning manure, flying through the air, being driven by parachute test dummies. I mean, it's, it's asinine. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's. No, no UFO believer or believer in anything else paranormal could possibly match the insanity that some of the, the explanations the sceptics come up with. I mean, my favourite is the joyriding ice cream van. Have you heard of that one? <laughs> I've got to tell you this, right. What Rendlesham Forest was, it was not an E.T. craft. What happened was a group of um, young hoodlums or thugs or whatever you call them, um, that night in Woodbridge, they broke into the house of an ice cream man who was away on holiday for the for Christmas, and they stole his ice cream van. And so then they drove up and down Capel Green with the lights flashing and the tune playing, ding, ling, 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 you know, as ice cream vans do. And that was what these highly trained Air Force security police personnel saw that night. I mean, you couldn't make it up. Well, you could, and that's the problem. You could make it up. Um, so... That's what that, that this is this is where you get you always know you've got a good UFO case 
if the if the skeptics explanations are even more in, out of this world than the believers you really really do now um another popular idea in, in ufology which has become quite it's become quite um, ingrained actually is that for, there are no such things as extraterrestrial craft okay and it's actually the it's actually a disinformation operation by government forces by the CIA by various other people like that who have actually deliberately spread the idea of extraterrestrial craft through the media and, and UFO in the UFO community in order to launder their own secret aviation projects like Area 51 what it means is that they will They'll put Bob Lazar out there and other people, or they'll they'll get people like him to feed information about flying saucers and Roswell and aliens in the fridge and things like that, because they don't want people knowing about their latest spy plane project. Now, I find I find that there may be there may be some truth in this in some cases. For instance, um, there there have been cases where um, there's a time when the Americans were fighting Filipino communists when they actually exploited a local mythology of something called an Aswang, which is a which is a vampire like creature which um exists in Filipino mythology. They actually killed some people. They put two puncture wounds in their neck and they drained the blood out of them. They hung them upside down on trees. And so the local communist guerrillas came across these um bodies and they thought the Aswang had got them and that terrified the hell out of them. So um they they lost the war. So there may be there may be some truth up to a point, but I mean it just does not fit. It does it just it doesn't fit. I mean there's some photographs. There's photographs of these flying triangle craft in Belgium, which um, have these four lights on them, one in the middle and one at each corner. Now according to some UFO debunkers, that's actually a stealth aircraft being tested, and the lights are there to make it look like an alien spacecraft. Well, um, on one level you think well that might make sense because. You know, someone's going to see that, and they're not going to go home and say, they, and tell their their parents, "Mum and Dad, I just saw you. I just saw a new high, highly secret American Air Force, rec, you know, reconnaissance aircraft. Reconnaissance aircraft. They're going to go home and they're going to say, I just saw a UFO. I just saw a creature from another planet. It's an alien.' Well, um, the thing about that is, it's on one level, it might make sense." You know, because they're not, you know, because they're, it's, they're not seeing what the government want them to see. But then it's an enormously risky gambit, You're drawing people's attention towards something for the purpose of deflecting it. I mean, it's it's something that could backfire in any number of ways. I mean, when it comes to Bob Lazar, I mean, I just told you about Bob Lazar. I mean, this is a good point, right? If these, if these skeptics um, are right, it means that Bob Lazar is a liar. He's being put out there to deliberately feed false information about UFOs and the intelligence services in America are encouraging him to do so because long as so long as people are staring slack jawed at the sky in Area 51 expecting to see a, a sport model flying saucer a UFO alien reproduction vehicles whatever they are they won't see the test flights of Aurora which I talked about earlier or any of the US Air Force's other experimental next generation aircraft but you draw people's attention towards something with the ultimate aim of turning their attention away. That's that's something that, I, like I said, could easily backfire. And the hoaxers must be very confident of their abilities to fool people. Because, I mean, when you think about it, it wouldn't take much for all these well-arranged cards to fall to the table. I mean, today, Area 51, it's a, it's a tourist destination. The Nevada governor has even renamed the road leading up to it the Extraterrestrial Highway. You can catch a tour bus from Las Vegas that will take you to the Groom Lake Road. You can have your photo taken beside the warning signs at the base's boundary. You can go to Rachel for a beer at the Little Ailey Inn and buy all the merchandise available. And Roswell, you go to Roswell and buy the same things there. And in one of these books, the author says the, the government will be keeping the UFO flame burning. Well, after, you know, when you think about it, it's because of Bob Lazar that everyone knows about Area 51, including the people who are looking for, you know, enemy spies and enemy agents who are actually looking for the Americans' new aircraft. So it's pretty much a debacle, and I imagine they dropped this entire UFO scenario altogether. So why do the flying saucers keep flying? Why do UFO sightings keep being reported? Why do UFO sightings date back long before any of this kicked off? 
if you want to look for a start to the UFO phenomenon, well, where where'd you go? I mean, it didn't all start with Betty and Barney Hill in 1961, where they, these were the supposedly the first people abducted by aliens. It didn't start with Roswell and Maury Island and, um, you know, Kenneth Arnold and his sighting in 1947. If you actually go back, there are actually UFO photographs that date back long before that time. Um, in fact, the earliest UFO photograph ever found was taken in 1817. This was not long after cameras were invented. UFO reports go back right through history. People used to use different terminology for them. They used to call them airships. Or, and they used to call the aliens trolls and goblins and fairies. But they're talking about the very same phenomenon. And it, it can be found all the way back through history. In fact, there's every reason to suppose that people were having these experiences in prehistoric times. In fact, there's even cave paintings which appear to, put, to, to show classic disc-shaped UFOs flying in the sky above people on the ground. <clears throat> so by all means look at the skeptics arguments. By all means look at both sides of the story. But I've just given you a reason why you should not necessarily take seriously what these people are saying. Because a lot of what they say is based on bad logic and falsehoods and lies. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X, the biggest paranormal show on radio. Right, well, it's space weather time. After last week's um, report, I've got a new one for you. I'll be doing a space weather report every week. Now, space weather, as I explained last week, is anything that happens in space that affects what goes on on the ground. And you'd be surprised how much does. A lot of what happens out there has a direct impact on what happens down here. So, I think this is a very, very important subject that it does need to be covered on the Ben Emling Jones Show. Right, um, well, tonight we've got a full moon. All together, one, two, three. Oh! Not bad, not bad. <laughs> the moon is rising at 7.36pm and it's setting at 5.15am. It's at opposite sides of the sky to the sun as is always the case during a full moon, because the Earth is effectively between the moon and the sun. Um, well, also, you may be interested to know that um, this full moon is a blue moon. Yeah, you've heard the phrase, once in a blue moon. Well, uh, blue moons are very rare, actually. They only happen every two or three years, and we've got one tonight. But you uh, may be disappointed to find out that nothing nothing to, in, blue, in a blue moon is anything to do with the colour. It doesn't relate to the colour. The moon will be the same colour as it all, usually is. I mean, some things do change the moon's colour, like um, dust in the sky and things like that, and pollution and um, th and other material, clouds can change the moon's colour. But um, the blue moon has nothing to do with that. What, what the blue moon refers to is the second full moon in any calendar month, because the, the cycle of the moon doesn't exactly match the calendrical months, and um, it's actually quite a rare thing. So every two or three years you get a blue moon. So once in a blue moon, well, you've got a blue moon tonight. So whatever it is you talk about when you say that little catchphrase, that little, that little proverb, do it tonight. All right? Sunrise, 6 o'clock a.m., sunset, 8.21 p.m. Now, the nights are starting to draw in. We're out of midsummer. There's no doubt about it. Still got nice weather out there. It's still fairly warm, but we're not in midsummer anymore. It's so, I mean, the sunrise at 6 a.m. does show it's a kind of milestone. We're heading towards that that descent into autumn and of course sunrise now sun, sunsets now 8 21 so that's quite late quite um, early compared to what it was in midsummer where it doesn't set until almost 10 p.m depending where all these figures depend on where you are in the world on um, cho i chose a random i choose a random spot in midlands england for these various uh, these reports Anyway, sunspots, these are the blemishes on the surface of the sun. As I said last week, please do not look at the sun with your naked eyes. Let alone with a telescope or something, all right? Never look at the sun yourself. Use the correct equipment because it's so hot and so bright it can damage your eyes, in some cases permanently. So please don't look at the sun. Use the correct equipment. Use trained staff. Or better still, just go to one of the various astronomy websites and um, look at it there. Um, the sunspot AR-17 has gone over the horizon now, and 1818 is about to follow, but there's a couple of new big ones, AR-1824 and AR-1827, and lots of scatterings of smaller ones in the southern tropic region of the solar disk. Spotless days, zero. Now, this has caused a few problems. We've had a high and jagged 
baseline in terms of solar flare activity, X-ray emissions from the sun. All of last week, um, multiple flares into the lower and mid sea range, and on Sunday we had a large twin peaked flare right up into the M range, and it was a very long drawn out one. It took many hours to dissipate. Um, since then, things have calmed down slightly, but the baseline is still high, and um, there's. There were two low energy but very long drawn out C-class flares today actually that caused a coronal mass ejection. That is basically an explosion of radiation out into space. Very intense radiation, like a huge nuclear explosion, only a million times bigger than any nuclear bomb we could build. Now we've, um, one of these CMRs just recently missed the Earth, we just caught the tail end of it, um, which was caused by the flare, the big flare on Sunday. Um, this new one actually could cause, could actually hit the Earth. Now, um, this CME is on its way, and it's likely to hit probably by, by, probably by the weekend. And now, if it does, don't worry. All right. Now, there's a lot of you'll probably hear a lot of disaster stories. And as I said last week, you know, there's been a lot of nonsense talked about the magnetic fields flipping in the sun. All right. You'll probably hear a few disaster stories about this. It. It's not the kind of coronal mass ejection that could cause any serious damage to the electrical grid. What it could cause, it could cause is sun. It could cause a lot of interference in the on your phone. It could cause problems with your TV reception, maybe internet difficulties, as well. But it'll be a temporary situation, and no permanent damage will be done. But it's just an example of how things out in space do affect what happens down here. Um, so look out for geomagnetic storms when that happens. And on the subject of the geomags, we've got a quite a high forecast. Yes, mid-latitudes, activity 35%, minor 10%, severe 1%. These are possibilities and chances. High latitudes, activity 10%, minor 30%, severe 45%. So this is the highest, it's the highest uh, geomag forecast I've seen in a long time. And it's all due to this CME, which is coming our way. Um, Near-Earth asteroids, right, on August 23rd, that is Saturday, I believe, we have 1999 CF9 coming past. It's 3,609 feet across, which is over a kilometre for those who think in this European Union way. Um, but it's a long way away, 24.7 lunar distances. That's a nice distance. Um, now, on August the 25th, we have 2013 QR1 coming through at 8.2 lunar distances. That's a big fella too, 754 feet across. That's a big, That's a big rock out there. Um, 2002 JR9 is coming past as well. Um, on I can't remember what I haven't written down what day that was. Sorry, but it's 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 upcoming. I think it actually might actually be the 31st of August, if I remember correctly. Sorry, I didn't write it down. Um, that's coming through, as I said, on that time. Um, it's it's big too. In fact, it's even bigger. It's 4,595 feet feet across. So it's a huge flying mountain, basically hurtling through space at very high speed. Now if it struck the Earth, it would cause some serious problems. It would cause tsunamis, earthquakes, climate change, you know, ice age. It could even trigger an ice age, all kinds of things it could do. Um, but don't worry, it's not going to get any closer to us than 63.5 lunar distances, which is over 20 million miles away. Um, to put that in perspective, it's the second closest natural body to the Earth regular is Venus. Now, its closest point of approach to the Earth when it's in line with the Sun is basically it's 98 lunar distances. Um, so this, this object is almost as far as 63 lunar distances. So don't worry, 20, 2002 JR9 is not going to hit the Earth. And it's not, you've got to realise that the, the dangers of asteroid impact are far lower than you might think if you read the various doom mongers websites. The astronomers know where pretty much all the big ones are now, and if they did find one with our name on it, we'd probably get a good few years' notice. And there are ways of deflecting them, and I'll talk about this in a future show. About the there's very very easy ways of knocking them off course and making them miss us. Solar wind speed 288 miles per second, density 24.5585 particles per cubic inch. So it's dropped. If you remember last week. It was 62.282 particles per cubic inch. Um, it's dropped a bit. This is all caused by the activity of these coronal mass ejections. Now, if you um, you listen to my show on on critical mass radio yesterday, you'll know that the speed has increased because it was 252.4 miles per second only last night, 
and the density has gone up has gone down though because it was 29 particles last night so that's this week's space weather hope you enjoyed that i certainly did get in touch with planet x call text email find us on facebook well um that brings to an end this week's ben emlyn jones show on planet x radio the second one and there's going to be a third one next week and many more after that I'm really, really pleased to be doing these programs because um, um, I do, I do actually really think that the, the stuff I talk about in the title, you know, um, ghosts, UFOs, and um, forbidden history and archaeology and chemtrails, and, and hospital porters, of course. <laughs> I think these um, these subjects, the paranormal and conspiratorial matters, you know, are is something I've realised over the years that these really are the most important issues affecting the world today. By far, in fact, almost all other the central problem of the central problem of planet Earth at the moment are these issues, and I think gaining an understanding of these issues has really become a necessity for us all. So um, I do appreciate that you do listen to what I say on the Ben, em- the ben Emlyn Jones show. I appreciate you listen to the other shows on Planet X Radio, and I do say to people, you know, don't just sit and listen. Don't think about it privately. Come out of the closet. Go and tell your friends. Take action on the information you've gained. Because that's how things change. That's how real, serious revolution comes about. I mean, they've done surveys on belief in conspiracy theories. And they found time and time again and again and again that levels of conspiratorial awareness are enormously high, surprisingly high. I mean, we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. Still to this day, more than 50% of Americans don't believe the government is telling them the truth about this. 30% believe in UFOs. Over a quarter believe that um, they believe that the government is not telling us the truth about UFOs. Um, I think 20% or people don't, you know, are suspicious over 9/11. Um, I think you know these. Obviously, there's a lot. There's a lot more people out there thinking these things than are talking about them. And if all those people started talking about them, came out of the closet and said, "Hi, my name's Ben, and I'm a conspiracy theorist," you know, if if more people did that, the world would transform. In a sense, our challenge is not so much getting the information out there, because although that is one of our duties, our main challenge is getting people who hear that information to take action on it. So, two, please. Bear that in mind. And I do appreciate you listening. Thanks very much. And I do appreciate your, appreciate your feedback. Keep your comments and suggestions coming. If you want me to cover a particular issue, do let me know. And I will be only too glad to research that and talk to you about it. This has been the Ben Emlyn Jones Show on Planet X Radio. Thank you very much. Good night and God bless. them I already knew some of them I hadn't met yet but um, it's always good to uh, meet up with uh, all kinds of people new friends familiar faces um, you know and to those who are in between so do go and see Santos Bonacci live if you get the chance I do recommend it heartily Planet X online on your mobile right um, and now we're going to discuss a a rather distressing subject but I think it does need to be discussed and that is the problem of trolls or cyberbullying whichever term you choose I know the correct term for a troll is something slightly different but I call them trolls Um, I'm basically referring to people who decide that this great medium we have the internet this great outlet for free expression and um, the publication of the thoughts of ordinary people, the greatest invention, I think, in those terms since the printing press. Some people um, decide, instead of doing the great good with the internet, which it could be could be done with it, which Planet X does with it, all the good we can do, these people decide to do a lot of bad with it. They take advantage of the anonymity and freedom that the internet gives to go around the internet antagonizing other people. Um, this is the worst kind of bullying, I think, the, the most 
sadistic and cowardly type. Um, and anyone who goes online and uses the internet for any period of time, it'll sooner or later come across one of these individuals. Now, um, I'm very, very well aware that... I mean, I've spoken about this myself before. I've talked about it a lot, and the, the medium is the media is covering is covering it now. And my first instinct is to be pleased because um, I'm I'm acutely aware that there are some people targeted by cyber bullies who are are far more vulnerable than a certain tough, ugly ex-hospital porter you might be familiar with. I know of cases in which which cyber bullies have driven people to depression and even suicide and in such cases I think there's blood on the hands of the trolls they're no better than murderers and so like I said my first instinct is to rejoice when the mainstream media covered not one but three such cases in the space of the week the first case they covered was of a lady called Caroline Criado Perez who um she was uh, she's a feminist campaigner and she was campaigning for um a woman's face that of Jane Austen to be placed on a banknote in this case the 10 pound note um especially those the the most familiar religious texts um like the old testament like the gospels the holy quran the torah are in fact full of symbolism and allegories of the stars and planets and the same goes for much more recent artwork like leonardo da vinci and um the, some architecture as well, like you get in churches and cathedrals, and in the Vatican. Now, Santos calls this field of study astrotheology. And it's really, really interesting, because there's no doubt that, in his mind, and I think in mine too, that whoever created these works knew an awful lot about the sky above us, and they wanted to encode that information cryptically into these texts. And... In fact, Santos says that there are seven levels of metaphor, which is rather like the Masonic law, because, of course, Masonic rites are supposedly to be interpreted differently depending on your degree within the Masonic hierarchy. Now, I should say now, it's not my intention to offend anyone, and I know that you know some of you listening will believe in some of the great religions in the world. You may well be Muslims, Jews, Christians, whatever, and it's not my intention to offend you at all. And I know you interpret these things literally, um, but the thing about it is, I mean, I think Santos here has a point, and I think, I don't want to un downplay the wisdom that you can find in many of these ancient religious texts, but at a high level they tell a different story. Now, who wrote them and for what purpose, I don't know. I mean, I know people would say, for instance, um, Jesus, Jesus died on the cross and he came back to life three years three days later all right now santos says that that is an allegory of the sun and the passage of the sun through the zodiac through the course of the year the, on the ecliptic as the earth goes around the sun in a, in the space of a year and there are very 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 large numbers of figures in mythology who um were born on the 25th of december to a virgin mother they uh, died and then they were buried and they came back to life three days later that's a recurring theme it's a meme that exists within um all kinds of ancient texts from ancient egypt um to indigenous cultures to um ancient babylon and sumer just it's just the way these stories happen to be and it's not to to i'm not downplaying the wisdom you can find in the gospels the the story, the message of jesus the same goes for the for the quran and for the, te the you know the, the Kabbalah or Jewish texts like the Torah. Okay, there is wisdom. There's goodness in those texts. Um, in, um, cyber bullying, uh, a very important subject, I think, is relevant. And um, once more, we're going to be talking about Area 51 being revealed, or not. We shall see. Anyway, stay tuned for that because also later on we're going to be talking about space weather, and I'll be doing my routine space weather report like I always do and that's very important because things out there do affect what goes on down here so stay where you're sitting and do not touch your dials all that is coming up get in touch with planet x call text email find us on facebook now santos bonacci is a man who most people in the alternative community have now heard of although a couple of years ago he was virtually unknown um now he's uh He's a very, very interesting man, and I do recommend you do go and see him live, 
if you get the chance because I, he's actually on a tour of the United Kingdom at the moment and um, it's this very well it's called Syncretism and Light yes uh, synchron Synchronitism and the Science of Light that's what it's called and um, he's basically he arrived on the beginning of the month and he's basically going all over the country speaking at very different, various different places he's speaking in Ireland as well and I think he's going over to the Netherlands to speak there now if you want to, you know, he actually, as this show goes to air, he's going to be speaking at Glastonbury. But um, to, tomorrow, he's actually going to be at the Truth Juice Gathering, which is at the Stonehenge campsite. And uh, then next Wednesday, he's going to be at Zoo Studios, Z-U, that is, which is in Lewis, East Sussex. On Friday the 30th of August, he's at Truth Juice Brighton. And Saturday the 30th of August, he's at the Passing Clouds Workshop in London. And on the Sunday after, the 1st of September... He's at the Bread and Roses pub in in uh, workshop, which is in London. So do go and see him if you get the chance. Now, he's a really, really interesting guy, as I said. And I went there to see him last Saturday with Sue, my girlfriend. And she was even keener than I was because she's a really dedicated fan of his. So we went to from Nottingham to Leicester to the Music Cafe, which is a very charming kind of pub, nightclub, theatre with a bohemian atmosphere so it's absolutely ideal and santos was there and he spoke from midday till six in the evening all all afternoon with breaks of course and he was packed with information i i, mean, I, I can't begin to relate the actual information in detail i didn't pick up all the details even though i was making notes as furiously as i could but um what he's basically discovered is that um a lot of the ancient texts in the world <laughs> This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. This is the Planet X Network, and stay tuned for the Ben Emlyn Jones Show. It's coming up next. And welcome, welcome to the Ben Emlyn Jones Show on Planet X Radio. Tune in for all the latest news, views and reviews from the world of government cover-ups, ghosts, UFOs, paranormal investigation, hidden knowledge, forbidden history and archaeology, chemtrails and hospital porters. Ah, the date is Wednesday, it is the 21st of August 2013. It's 8pm and I do hope you're all sitting comfortably and awaiting this show which is coming and I've got a awful lot to talk about this evening but um, first of all thanks to everybody who uh, wrote to me after um, last week's show which of course was the first Ben Emlyn Jones show on Planet X Radio people were saying congratulations on a new program saying how much they liked it saying you know they really really thanking me for what I did and I want to say to those people I really appreciate your support and thank you very much it's really really good that you like you do enjoy what I do and um, I hope you'll enjoy this program as much as you did last week's our first one um someone interestingly told me that i have the perfect voice for radio which is uh, really really great because um for many years people have told me i've got the perfect face for radio so now i have the perfect voice as well so it's a double bonus thank you very much on today's show we're going to discuss um well i'll tell you what i've been up to since the last program i've been to see santos bonacci live at Truth Juice Leicester. Now that was quite something, I'll tell you. I've got a lot to say about that. We're also going to be discussing... Now, Santos Bonacci. Now, I mean, no one had heard of him until about three years ago. Um, see, he's um, he's taken... this. Like I said, he's become very well known re since then. And I was quite, it was quite amazing to meet him because he's a lot smaller than I expected, I must say. He's only five foot something and he's 
really slim. He's very slender indeed. And so he's a tiny little bloke, <clears throat> but he's got this broad smile and he's twinkling bright dark eyes and amazing energy, you know, amazing spirit he he has. And he's very warm and down to earth because when we got there, the doors were shut and he arrived at the same time. So he queued with the rest of us and he was talking to us in the queue. And there must have been about there must have been about 50 people there. Um and he was just sitting there chatting with us. And he's very, very easy going too when there's a crisis because um, his PowerPoint failed at a crucial, at a crucial moment during his speech, which um, anyone who uses PowerPoint will know that that does happen very often. Um, and he just chuckled and he carried on with his speech while the technical support crew fiddled around desperately with it. Um, <clears throat> it's, it was really, really good to see. And um, I mean, he used a whiteboard and pen for most of his visuals anyway, so it wasn't really a problem. But he did strike me as someone who's just picks himself up and keeps going in in spirit in 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 a um, healthy spirit of optimism now um he speaks with this very lively intelligent tone as well he's got this strong australian accent but he can really really speak well indeed and um very very eloquent and articulate and he is an expert linguist he doesn't only speak english he does he speaks spanish and he does interviews in spanish and he is of italian extraction and he speaks italian fluently also japanese because apparently he's married to a japanese woman but also i hear he speaks french and portuguese um he's been interested in this subject which he he calls astrotheology as i said um he's been studying it for over 30 years but um you know this is almost like the culmination of what he's learned in all that time and i think his work fills this major gap in our attempts to uncover this esoteric world that you might have heard about um, which is hidden from us by the powers that be and um, people like um, Lincoln, Bajant and Lee with the Holy Blood, Holy Grail have written about this Lynn Picknett and Lawrence Gardner, people like that um, they've been trying to uncover this too and Santos Bonacci I think deserves to be included among those for sure um, he's, he likes Dr. Louis Turi I, I asked him about Dr. L Dr. Turi because um, Dr. Turi of course was on the last um, Planet X radio show and um, Santos knows him and um, he's, he likes him and um, I met up with some other lots of friends there and there was lots of people there some of them